on a special Sabbath where we have a health outreach program running outside of the building. I have a charge for you. Put on health. Put off sickness. The right order is that. Put off sickness. Put on health. When I first had a chance to go to Africa, as a student, it was more than 15 years ago, I received at the end of uh, the evangelistic campaign from the church in which I preached a beautiful set of uh, African clothes. Beautiful set. It wasn't this one. This is beautiful too. But that was even more beautiful. It was blue with some beautiful embroiderment. I don't know if you know what the color blue signifies, what the symbolism of blue is in the Bible. What is it? Oh, no. It's love. Love. Go do your research and you'll find that out. So that set of clothes was very special to me. I put it on a few times in the house just to show it to some people. I never wore it in public. Why? Well, because I felt I was going to look weird with those garments in public. Then, uh, 10 years ago, around that time, I got a call from the manager of uh, Share Him, the same organization that took me to Cameroon as a student missionary. They called me and they asked me to go back to the same place, but this time as a project manager for one of their mission trips with students. Would I go? Of course I would. But this time, I had much more responsibility than before. So I took my role very seriously, and I did what everybody should do when they go on foreign mission. Do your cultural research. Try to understand that culture. I should have done that before, when I first went there. But this time, I found out something very interesting about clothes in the African mindset. When Africans give you a set of clothes, there is an invitation for you to become one of them. Because in Africa, Clothes means belonging and status. So when they offer you a set of clothes, you're offered an invitation, hey, now you can be one of us. And when I understood this reality behind clothes, I said, all right, if they will ever give me a set of clothes, then I will wear that set of clothes, not only in the house, but also publicly, because now I am one of them. So this morning, I am from Cameroon, representing, because the outward look of a Cameroonese person is practically a representation of identity, of who they are. You know, 
In the Bible, in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, as main topic, as main theme of his writing, focuses on health. Actually, when I say health, I mean salvation. Because biblically, salvation is healing. Biblically, when the Bible says to save, it also means to heal. And you probably remember Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 8, for by grace you have been, what? Well, healed, because salvation is healing as well. For by grace you have been healed, saved, through faith or faithfulness. His faithfulness that gives birth to my faithfulness to Him. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Verse 10, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Lord, here we are again looking at your message of salvation, your message of healing. May your Spirit guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul returns to this idea that uh, he expresses in chapter 2 verse 10 that we should walk in the good works that God prepares beforehand for us. He prepares the good works and we are supposed to walk in them. This is what he says in verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. So you should not walk, no longer walk as the rest because you are now different. You have been saved. You have been healed. And you may think, okay, so then how should I walk? And uh, you jump a few verses from verse 20. He says, you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off, you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and this is the focal point of this section here, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, metanoia, that's the word for conversion, for repentance, for renewing, the spirit of your mind should be renewed, verse 24, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in Christ Jesus in true righteousness and holiness. The Greek says in the righteousness and the holiness of the truth. That's the final part of uh, the verse. In the righteousness and the holiness of the truth. Please notice something. This is the imagery of the Apostle Paul. You and I, as we have been saved, as we have been healed by grace through faithfulness, we are to walk. We are to walk in a certain way in some kind, some special kind of works. And then he takes this illustration one step further and he says, well, you know, in order for you to walk, you need to, to dress up. You will not walk naked. You need a certain kind of clothes to be able to walk that kind of walk. But he says, in order for you to be able to put on the new man, 
before you have to do what? You have to put off what? The old man. So it's undressing first and then dressing. You put some things off and then you put some things on. There is a false conception in Christianity today where the impression is given to you that everything, when it comes to conversion, when it comes to salvation, when it comes to healing, everything happens on the inside. Everything happens in your heart. Yes, but in my heart, you know, I am like this and like that. Yes, but, you know, within myself, this is and that is the reality. Well, the Apostle Paul says, yes, metanoia has to happen, a new mind, a changed mind, which also has an impact on submitting your heart to God. But those things are not visible. Nobody will be able to see what is happening in your heart unless what is happening in your heart is visible on the outside. Correct? That's why Paul uses the illustration of putting off clothes and putting on clothes. Putting off the old man and putting on the new man. In which you are created according to God in the righteousness and holiness of the truth. What truth? Well, truth as it is in Jesus, we've seen last time, truth that is an overlap of uh, the truth as it is in Jesus, Jesus being the incarnate truth of the written truth, the Word of God. With that in mind, let's see some of the examples the Apostle Paul gives as to what we should put off or take off. Verse 25, therefore, or wherefore, he says, one, putting away or putting off or stripping off, lying. And the Greek word is pseudos, pseudo, falsehood, or fake. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, and he quotes from the book of Zechariah, for we are members of one another. Because we are members of one another, we don't want to lie, we don't want to be false to one another, right? Putting away lying or falsehood. Well, do we use lying? Do we have falsehood among us? You know, many things can be interpreted as lying or falsehood, even if they are not that. For instance, if somebody does not give you a piece of information you would think you would deserve to have from that person, then you may think, well, that person is fake, that person is false to me because he or she did not share that information with me. And that's yes or no. You never know. Or somebody may have, hap may have done something, something may have happened, and then you ask somebody that was involved in the very action, and that person gives you a version of what happened, and then you have somebody else that gives you another version of what happened, and you say, yeah, somebody is lying here. Well, not necessarily, because recollections are not perfect. In fact, in a court, if you have witnesses and all the witnesses speak exactly the same way, there's a likelihood they have agreed to lie together. So, yes, recollection is not perfect, and everybody may give you the best version of their recollection. Or, 
If you ask somebody, what do you believe about this or that? Maybe they are asking about your theological belief. What do you believe about this? And you give them your best answer to that question, what you believe. And then a few days later, they hear you say something totally different. And you would say, well, you lied to me. Well, yes and no. Why? Because that person may have changed his or her understanding of that certain thing. Because we learn every single day. What if I had a revelation last night? I can't just run around and tell everybody, hey, now I think this differently. No. But there are things that are very tangibly false or can be very accurately perceived as being falsehood. I remember this happened long time ago in a far, far away country. Somebody came to the pastor's office and told me, Pastor, that person looked pretty, pretty frustrated. Pastor, we should do something about this. We should somehow kindly, nicely tell this person to stop this poetry reciting because this person doesn't have a gift of reciting poems. And this person even thinks she is a poet and she's not. We should somehow do something about it. And yes, that person was somebody that would, would just jump up and recite a poem in front of the, of the congregation that she wrote. Right? Not too much talent, for sure. And I agreed, yeah. Because here's the thing, in ministry, and we are, we are speaking about real stuff happening among the members. In ministry... If somebody decides he or she wants to do ministry in an area of no giftedness for that person, that is a pain for that person, but it's even more a pain for the members. So I agreed, yes, we should do something about this. We should somehow help this person discover her giftedness and work in that area, do ministry in that area of giftedness. Poetry doesn't seem to be that. And now we are leaving the office, and whom do we stumble upon? That exact person, the poet that recites poetry. And the person that came to complain said, oh, thank you so much, sister. That was such a blessing. And I'm like, was it? Was it really a blessing? The Apostle Paul says, put off lying. Put off falsehood. And put on what? Lying or falsehood? No. Put on truth, speaking the truth. There is a mistake there. <laughs> you don't take falsehood off and then you put falsehood on. You take falsehood off and then put telling the truth on. Yes, we should be able to be honest and telling the truth among us, but it's not easy to tell somebody he or she is not gifted in, in that area, is it? How will you do that? That may come with some angry faces and words. And that's exactly what Paul speaks about. Next verse. Be angry and do not sin. And he quotes Psalm 4, verse 4, from the Septuagint. But the Hebrew actually says, tremble, shake, or quiver, that's the word. Tremble and do not sin. Have you ever been so angry that you trembled? You, you were shaking? 
okay? So yeah, that's, that's the natural physical reaction or phenomenon behind a, a, a very almost aggressive inner reality. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place or topos or spot to the devil. Be angry. Is it all right for a Christian to be angry? Yes or no? Yes? So whenever you're angry, you're angry because it's right to be angry? You know, there is a famous saying uh, that is attributed to Aristotle. I don't know if it really belongs to him, but I saw it quoted from him in many, many places. This is what he says, and this is fourth century before Christ. He says, anyone can become angry. That is easy. But to be angry with the right person and to the right degree and at the right time, and for the right purpose, and in the right way, that is not within everyone's power, and that is not easy. Have you ever seen Jesus angry? Yes? Let me show by a few Bible verses. Mark chapter 3, verse 5. And when he looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. I don't know if he was trembling or not, but he was moved in a certain way. Mark 10, 14, but when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased, and many translated, he was indignant or angry, even furious, and said to them, he said something to them in a certain way. Mark 11, verse 17, these are words that Jesus said, with a whip in his hand, a whip that he wind, winded or wound, wound up from cords. My house shall be called the house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. And they were paralyzed by his countenance. This is Jesus. And if you go to those contexts, you will see that in every context, there is abuse, there is injustice going on against the vulnerable. In one case, against the sick. In the other case, against the children that were brought to him. And in the other case, the poor were exploited by the rich. Yes, Jesus had angry reactions, but be angry, Paul says, but do not sin. There is a sinless kind of anger. How can you be angry like that, like Jesus? Because He was angry rightly, rightfully, and righteously. The Apostle Paul gives you some anger management principles here, two of them. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Okay, so that means it should be short-lived. It should not be extended from one day to the other and to the other and to the other. But to some of us, this sounds very difficult. It's it's easier probably to keep the sun on the sky than let anger go. As this couple, they were completing 50 years of marriage and the same question was asked, what is the secret of a long-lasting marriage? And she answered, you know, the secret is we've never gone to bed without settling our differences to which him, he reacted and said, yes, and there have been a few times when we went without sleep for 10 days. <laughs> it kept the sun in the sky. 
pretty difficult. No, 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 let it go. Because with the evening, according to the Bible, a new day starts. That's why when I ask you what day is now on a Wednesday evening, that is Thursday. When you start a new day, you start that new day with new thoughts, with having that conversation with the good Lord. And He teaches you and helps you implement these anger management principles. And the second principle, do not give place or topos, spot to the devil. The devil doesn't need a big, big territory, a little spot, a foothold, a toehold, or as they use it in the military, a beachhead. Do you know what a beachhead is? There's a little spot, and from there they can launch the destruction, the attack. These are the two principles. Don't let it become grudge. And don't give place to the devil, spot to the devil between you and somebody or somebody's or you and your spouse. So the Apostle Paul says, this is what you have to do with this. That's the second to remove. Sinful anger is gone. And you put on sinless anger. Why? Because those things that disturbed and made Jesus angry should disturb and make you angry as well. Be angry, but do not sin. Let the sun not set on your wrath and do not give spot to the devil. Third, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor or toil or work hard, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Well, we live in an America where there are lazy people. It seems that there were lazy people in Jesus' time as well and in Paul's time as well. What I'm getting from what I gather here and there is that in America, we have reached a place now where somebody that works with his or her hands can easily gain more than an intellectual that works with his or her head. What that means is that very few people today want to work trades. Electrician, painter, carpenter, plumber, and so on and so forth. The Apostle Paul says, hey, still no longer. It seems that in that church, I hope there's nobody here, but in that church of Ephesus, there were people that were stealing. They had a hard time working. They would rather steal. He said, no, 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 stop stealing and start working with your hands. With my hands? But I'm an intellectual. Yeah, but your work with your hands may put bread on your table when your intellectuality would not. You may need to learn some skills so you will be able to work with your hands. In no case should you steal. The other day I was painting and installing stuff in uh, our kids' room and uh, my four-year-old came to me and said, Hey, Daddy, what are you doing here? Working hard? And I said, yeah, working hard. Oh, okay. And he left. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, <laughs> he's a child. But, but we see that in society today. 
When, when people notice that there is place for working hard, they would rather go. I noticed something else very interesting. We had to install a new internet provider, and uh, now uh, they, they don't even come to install it as they used to. Only if you cannot manage it, and for sure I cannot, so I had to call, and uh, they sent somebody, and somebody came. But before that person came, a few days later, of course, I got, I don't know how many, but close to 10 calls or messages asking me if the problem was fixed in the meanwhile. It almost sounded like everybody was hoping I will or somebody will miraculously fix it, that the handyman, the guy that works with hands, would not have to come. The Apostle Paul emphasizes work, even hard work. And yes, Seventh-day Adventists emphasize the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment with a focus on rest. I don't know if you've noticed the fourth commandment, half of it at least, is about work. It says work six days and rest one. Let's teach ourselves and our children about this because there might be times in the future when all our intellectual abilities will be useless and we will need hands to work to put bread on the table. So, take off laziness, put off laziness and stealing, put on hard work and generosity so he can give something to the one that is in need. Next, let no corrupt word Proceed out of your mouth. And the word corrupt here is sapros. You may know what that means. You have saprophyte or saprotroph in English. Sapros means rotten, putrid. And saprophyte or saprotroph means a plant or a fungus or a microorganism that feeds on that sapros, on that putrid or rotten organic material. Now, there are people that are, in a way, saprophytes and saprotrophs, those that are like, they, they are like nurtured, they, they feed on those kind of putrid and rotten things. But Paul says, let no rotten word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for Necessary edification for building up, the Greek says, of the need, or as the need may be. You see a need and you use the word of edification that it may impart grace. It may impart grace to the hearers. Now that is important as well. Because, you know, those putrid words that can leave our mouths coming straight from the heart can linger for a long time. A few years ago, I was still in, in uh, my country of origin, Romania. I had a car and uh, uh, I drove to my mom's house. I love mushrooms. I don't know if you know what that means when I say I love mushrooms. I grew up going to the forest and collecting my own mushrooms. So I would go back to mom, and mom would always have in her, uh, um, what is that? Not in the pantry, in, not in the fridge, in the freezer. She would have bags of uh, mushrooms. And she took one and gave it to me, and I was happy. Only that when I got home late in the night, I forgot about it. Next morning, I got in my car, drove to my workplace, and worked inside a building all the way to the end of the day. And in the evening, when I hopped into my car, 
I smell something funny. I said, wow, what is that? It dawned on me, the mushrooms. So I ran to the back of the car, opened the trunk. The problem is the juice of the mushroom leaked into the carpet. So yes, I removed the mushroom that evening, but the juice was there. And next day, man, that juice, <laughs> that juice became really bad. And the, the next week, I, I realized I had to clean it out. And I did all kind of cleaning procedures. No, after a month, I could still smell it. Years later, I sold the car. <laughs> and the last smell that stuck, I still can't feel it, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's the effect of putrid words. No, put it off. Put it off and put on words that impart what? Grace. Yes. And then the Apostle Paul brings in something or somebody out of nowhere, it seems. This is what it says. And do not grieve, do not pain the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We have read about the Holy Spirit before because in every chapter here in the book of Ephesus or Ephesians, there is something about the Holy Spirit. In chapter 1, it says, In whom, that is in Christ also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who which, or who or which, well, some will debate here if it's who or which, is the guarantee or the pledge of our inheritance. You know, there are people, even in the Seventh-day Adventist church, that say, yeah, the Holy Spirit is not a person. The Holy Spirit has to be less than a person. And there's all kind of theories. And I want to be honest to the text, who and which there is a neuter, so it can be translated both ways. But let's go to chapter 2. For through Him, that is Christ, we both have access by one Spirit to the Father, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling, dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Is that a person or less of a person? Hmm, hard to say. Let's move on. The mystery of Christ revealed by the Spirit. Uh, is that a person or just a foggy force or energy or something. To his holy apostles and prophets, that he, that is Christ, would grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit. Is that a person or just a power? And you get to chapter 4, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. Can you see that the spirit, the Son, and God are listed, all three of them there? So there must be some sort of commonality among the three of them. But back to our text, and do not grieve, do not pain the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Why does Paul say this in this context? Well, simple, because it is the Holy Spirit that keeps telling you, keeps whispering in your ears, into your ears, and tell you, put it off, put it on, put this off, put this on. The voice of the conscience that signals what is good and what is bad within you. That is the Holy Spirit speaking to you. You cannot grieve somebody that you have no interaction with. The fact that Paul says you can grieve the Holy Spirit means that the Holy Spirit is in interaction with you. And the Holy Spirit is the one that takes it off and puts it on. Indeed, because if you continue, look what it says, 31. Let all bitterness or acridity, harshness, wrath or rage, anger. Oh, see, that's the bad anger there. Clamor or yelling. Or yelling. 
And evil speaking, and the word in Greek is blasphemia, blasphemy, slander, vilification, defamation, denigration, be put away from you with all malice. So all these things, all these things put away with all malice, put away. But look, it doesn't say you put away. It says be put away from you. Passive voice. You know why? Because it is the Holy Spirit that does that as an agent of Jesus Christ, because he said, I'm going to the Father, I'm sending you the other comforter, the Holy Spirit that will stay with you. Yes, the Holy Spirit is the one speaking to you and telling you, giving you the power to put away those things with all malice. And then it says, verse 32, and be or become, become kind to one another, Tender-hearted, the Greek is having good bowels, having good guts toward one another, good viscera, forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. And that's the focal point. That's where he's heading. Forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. How did God in Christ forgive us? Just a few verses very quickly. Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. It's not that God cannot remember. He's not hit by amnesia. He decides not to remember. Then 1 John chapter 9, verse 19, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgive us our sins is based on confession. You confess, He forgives. And one more, just to see the attitude of God, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, Christ died before we changed. So His willingness to forgive us was there before we even accepted His sacrifice because He died while we were still sinners. And I would like to read something from uh, Thoughts from the Month of Blessings. Ellen White says, We should not think that unless those who have injured us confess the wrong, we are justified in withholding from them our forgiveness. Watch this, because this is based on the Bible. The availability, availability of forgiveness is there with God before we ask for forgiveness. He's available. He's ready to forgive. It is their part, no doubt, to humble their hearts to repentance, by repentance and confession. But we are to have a spirit of compassion toward those who have trespassed against us, whether or not they confess their faults. Mm -hmm. If you were waiting for somebody to come, and then you will see, you may need to change that. However sorely they may have wounded us, we are not to cherish our grievances and sympathize with ourselves over our injuries. But what? But as we hope to be pardoned for our offenses against God, we are to pardon all who have done evil to us and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Oh, wait, wait, wait. So God forgives us based on our forgiveness? No, no, you missed something. Here, the one that prays starts the prayer with our Father in heaven. So 
he or she has been already forgiven. The Father in heaven forgave you. And now you will need again forgiveness. But if you are not ready to forgive others, then how on earth would you be able to accept his forgiveness again? So that's why there's a chain of forgiveness. He forgave us. We forgive others. God forgives us again. We forgive others again. Because take it or not, love it or not, life, Christian life, is about forgiveness. I was asked to close with a song this morning and I realize we have few songs about forgiveness. Very few. Or we have songs about forgiveness, about God forgiving us and that's it. Not too many songs speak about we forgiving others. But I found one in the hymnal. I didn't even know this song existed. It's hymn 299 I'm uh, not very familiar with this one, but I want to invite you to sing together. It's short and very comprehensive. And I believe this forgiveness thing is the biggest reality for us in our Christian walk, the biggest. Because in the process of healing, God's forgiveness is the biggest, the first and foremost reality. And that's the same for us. The first and foremost reality, we have to put on forgiveness. You know, I've seen people lying in a casket. And as they were lying in the casket, you could see that they had forgiveness put on only that it was too late for those that were around them. They looked good. For what? What helped? Who was held by it? I have a colleague, a pastor colleague. The other day I spoke with him uh, and uh, he said, you know, my son is a mortician. Mortician, what is that? And he said, well, he's the guy that makes dead people look good in the casket. I, I thought, oh my goodness, see? How important that is. Isn't it more important to look good outside of the casket? Like put on those things before you get there? So that people will not have to lie about you when you are beautifully dressed. Or that people will, will not have to think, yeah, if we only had a chance to, to straighten this out, to have that moment of, of reconciliation, of closure. Yes, this is important. Let us sing together, forgive our sins as we forgive. <clears throat> As we forgive, you taught us, Lord, to pray, but you alone can grant us grace to live the words we say. How can your pardon rich and bless the unforgiving heart that put on wrong and will not let all bitterness depart in 
a blazing light your cross reveals the truth within in you how trifling others get to us how great are that to you Lord cleanse the death within our souls and with resentment cease then by your mercy reconciled spread your peace. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Among the desires of our hearts right now, there is one that is first and foremost. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, amen.